Hello, I'm George Seifers with Signal Magazine, and I welcome you to the Signal webinar series. Today's web webinar is with Acronis SCS, and it is entitled DOD Approved Mission Ready Backup, How to Increase, Situa How to Increase Operational Assurance for Federal Endpoints. During the webinar, which will take about an hour, John Zanny and John Downey will discuss the unique cyber threats facing the federal government today along with a new solution for providing complete asset protection. Let me introduce you to our guests. John Zanny is the CEO of Acronis SES. Prior to joining Acronis SES, John was the general manager of the Microsoft Service Provider SPLA business. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Mathematical Physics from California State University, Northridge. John Downey is the Vice President of Sales at Acronis SCS. He is an expert in mapping product capabilities to the U.S. private sector. Throughout this webinar, attendees are welcome to submit questions electronically through the Ask a Question box on the webinar console. When our experts are finished presenting, we will have a Q&A for as long as time allows or until we run out of questions. And with that, I think we are ready to begin. John Zanny, would you like to start? Uh, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar, uh, broadcasting live uh, from our homes. Uh, let's see if we can make it through the hour without a dog barking or some other sounds. So a quick view of who we are, Acronis SCS. Uh, we're a company based on Scottsdale, Arizona, that is specifically focused on providing uh, cyber protection to the U.S. public sector. So that includes federal government, state and local government, and other public sector entities like healthcare, uh, nonprofit, and, and education. Uh, we uh, have been serving the public sector for over 16 years. Uh, we have over 300 U.S. patents, and uh, uh, we have designed this organization so that uh, all the data for the U.S. public sector and information stays in the United States, and any interaction with my team or support, product support, are with U.S. citizens also based uh, here in the United States. What we've seen happen uh, here uh, recently is that the threat uh, coming from bad actors or cr criminals has significantly increased since the uh, onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. So while uh, public sector was uh, always a significant target of attack, they now know, uh, uh, they now uh, have increased uh, that level of intensity. Some of it we believe is just there are more people at home that are bored, some need money, and so they're willing to go after uh, after uh, any source that they can find. And uh, because of the work from home uh, movement, that's created a lot of opportunity for them now that we have uh, uh, networks and endpoints and edge devices uh, that are connected to uncontrolled or unsecure uh, environments. If you look at cryptojacking attacks, which is uh, when uh, somebody uh, takes control of your computer but doesn't really tell you and starts mining for Bitcoin and other uh, cryptocurrency so that they can make uh, money, this too has uh, significantly uh, increased since the onset of COVID. Uh, this data is based on what we're seeing from our own existing customer base. Uh, so what you can see is uh, the bad actors, unfortunately, are taking advantage of this situation versus trying to uh, be a good citizen and, uh, uh, and help us all work together uh, to get past uh, this pandemic. It, if we look in general at public sector uh, data threats, uh, what you can see is there's a significant number of cyber attacks that's happening uh, on 
a regular basis, uh, as you see here, over 31,000 uh, attacks, 16% uh, of those uh, uh, being targeted are, of all data breaches, are targeted at the U.S. Uh, public sector. A fairly significant uh, increase uh, in attacks targeted at, at public sector. And um, that leads to significantly compromised uh, data, uh, uh, which uh, in, in some cases is actually personal data, not just organizational data. And what this means is that uh, on one side, the fact that we all have digital personas and digital lives has uh, helped us uh, be able to weather uh, this pandemic in that uh, while there's not a 100% uh, gain in pr or maintenance of productivity, there isn't a 100% loss because we're able uh, to work remotely, work from home, work in other environments. At the same time, uh, we're now uh, in a position where uh, protecting the edge and protecting the endpoint uh, might not have been as critical in the past, is now super critical to make sure uh, that uh, none of the data, uh, whether it's organizational or personal, is compromised. Uh, one of the uh, comments I get uh, fairly often uh, when I talk to uh, agencies or groups within the public sector is that they'll think that they're not a target. Uh, I'm too small. Uh, who cares about Superior Arizona? Uh, I'm just a little agency. The truth is everyone is subject to an attack and no one is immune. And uh, many of the past ransomware attacks uh, caused so much damage because they went way beyond uh, the targeted audience. And so here I posted some examples of where uh, different departments you might think have not been um, a target of attack were attacked this year, right? The Department of Health and Human Services uh, uh, was, uh, that attack was trying to slow down the agency's response to ongoing, the ongoing pandemic. Uh, so think, of, think about that. Uh, these people, uh, they're not just like an inconvenience where you have to pay money. Now it's affecting people's livelihoods and in some cases their lives. Uh, the Department of T Defense, uh, there was a uh, uh, cryptocurrency mining uh, attack uh, last January. Uh, I assume uh, you heard uh, just recently what happened with the Well World uh, Health Organization in the increase in attacks uh, that they saw, uh, and then also within this uh, uh, last February. Uh, so these are just a sampling of uh, the bad actors targeting just about anybody they can target. In some cases, it's uh, for money. In other cases, it's just to cause problems and disruption, and sometimes death. So uh, at this moment, a poll uh, has uh, popped up. Uh, this is uh, to ask you how COVID-19 uh, has uh, impacted your uh, endpoint end security approach. Uh, we, we've asked uh, every one of our partners and continue to ask our customers so that we can tune uh, our products and offerings to make sure uh, that's in line with uh, your approach. So any data or information you can provide in the poll is tremendously useful so we can make sure uh, to provide for you what you need to be uh, protected. And with that, I'm going to hand off to uh, John Downey, uh, our re resident federal uh, expert, uh, to talk to you more about uh, what we're seeing out there and how you can protect yourself. John, it's all yours. Thanks, John. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time kind of segueing. And the reason we talk about, um, you know, attacks during the COVID-19 pandemic is obviously a lot of agencies um, and, you know, organizations across the world have been forced to move to a more remote workforce, right, which means there are endpoints that are now 
um, still required to connect in some form or fashion back to critical data stores, critical assets in the core network, perhaps the data center, and they're doing so um, outside of the protective banner of the network um, firewalls and the defense perimeters that have been built up over the last several decades. And what we see is there's what I would consider kind of a conflict of interest between um, where the industry has gone from a technology uh, evolution perspective and what the core security requirements are of many of our DOD customers and the federal systems integrators. And as they both evolve, it seems to me um, and a number of our customers that industry at large is um, moving in a direction that really supports growth in the commercial space, and they're trying to make those sorts of advancements, licensing models, and things of that nature fit in DOD architecture. Um, and as I'm sure all of you on the call here know, that it's no easy feat, right, to just simply implement a, a commercial off-the-shelf solution uh, in this day and age uh, because of all the requirements related to uh, securing the product. And not enough companies, uh, in our opinion, and in a lot of DOD leadership's opinion, um, have gone the distance to, um, you know, really support the mission, right? So if we look at the way industry at large is moving, everything is moving to a more cloud-enabled, cloud-first, you know, API-centric uh, service uh, as, or software as a service offering, right, which means subscription and recurring revenue. That's driven largely by shareholders, investors. Um, they want that recurring revenue. They want to move as many customers as possible from uh, a CapEx model um, to a, an operational, an OpEx model, right? So that you have annual subscriptions that are recurring. In the commercial world, oftentimes a lot of things are driven by consumption. So you have commitment levels that you know, customers are agreeing to and um, the idea is to get as much of their data uh, in your uh, repository, whether it's the cloud um, or some sort of, you know, on-prem data management platform that is still connected to the core data center of that vendor in some capacity, right? Because in order to operate under a subscription or a software as a service or an IaaS infrastructure as a service model, um, you need some level of connectivity to, you know, ensure license compliance, notify things like, um, you know, upcoming renewals, upcoming subscription renewals, new features available, you know, constantly trying to enable the end users at the interface, right, of wherever that is, whether it's the endpoint or the data center, um, to make it much easier for them to send their data in some form or fashion to a repository hosted by the vendor, right? And obviously, that creates a lot of havoc for DOD environments where connectivity uh, largely is frowned upon outside, especially with sensitive environments, and certainly with air gap networks, it's just not even a possibility. So with the speed of which, you know, industry is racing to deliver newer features, newer functionality, it also, in and of itself, uh, that race to be first to market um, presents a lot of vulnerabilities, right, within the technology itself that have yet to be flushed out. And I think that's why we're seeing, you know, an increased rise of zero-day attacks and, and these anti-ransomware attempts, or excuse me, these ransomware attempts, um, because vendors are moving very, very quickly, and um, the, the bad actors are, are having a field day kind of exploiting, um, you know, products that have not really been through the security QA process strong enough specifically uh, around deployment um, to commercial entities, public sector customers, uh, and so forth. And a lot of that is because, um, you know, the commercial sector, right, the commercial segment of any marketplace is arguably much larger, right, than just the DOD or the federal government. Um, so that means that a lot of the product management, R&D, uh, marketing efforts, partnerships that are driven at the vendor side are relegated to supporting commercial enterprise customers or small businesses that have very different needs and security requirements than that of our DOD uh, customers and our federal system integrator partners. Anybody that's been selling software or hardware to the DOD for a, you know, an organization um, knows the pain points of having to compete internally uh, for mindshare with product managers and developers uh, to, you know, to tailor products and services that meet their DOD customers' needs all the while competing with their peers on the enterprise commercial side or the medlar or small business side for what they deem to be most required first, right? So we're kind of always competing with each other to see who can get the core features and functionality of their customer base into the product first. Uh, and it's usually an uphill battle for folks that focus on the niche market of, you know, the DOD and, and the federal government. Um, a lot of times as a result then, 
we see that uh, products are released with no regard for, you know, uh, legacy architecture, um, proprietary applications that system integrators build, platforms that they deliver, um, integration uh, between a number of different COTS solutions along with the proprietary applications. Um, they have no real regard for sensitive or, or you know, air gap networks. Um, and certainly for mission critical assets, right, that are generating sensitive data but not necessarily hosting it. And of course, the DOD and, and the federal government at large are kind of notoriously behind the adoption curve of technology. And a lot of that has to do with either budget constraints, you know, a lack of expertise for implementation, um, you know, the migration from an old legacy architecture that is running mission critical operations uh, is, you know, was built 20, 30 years ago. And the folks that actually helped develop that are just, you know, long since gone, retired, right, and are not part of the, the DOD architecture workforce anymore. And of course, there's always the red tape related to getting authority to operate uh, for any solution. And what we're seeing now um, with the efforts from Undersecretary Lord's Office of Procurement and Sustainment and headed by Katie Arrington is that they're looking for more scrutiny on the security posture of, of uh, contractors, federal systems integrators and their subs, um, and basically saying that internally speaking, they have to be protecting their own networks in the same capacity that they're expected to protect uh, the DOD networks. Um, so, all this leads to um, the concept that um, what we're seeing is that industry at large is kind of leaving what we believe to be a large underserved population of the DOD behind, right? Because there's a lot of obstacles to adopting the latest, greatest technology that would increase productivity, uh, all the while, you know, maintaining a very tight security posture. Um, so whether that's product development or from, you know, a vendor side or just the way that they license uh, their software or hardware models. Um, are not really conducive to the way the budget cycles have historically worked within the DOD, and it's not conducive to the operational models for most of our DOD customers. And so our focus here at Synchronous SES was to kind of change that paradigm, break off from our parent company, um, form an independent subsidiary, and have our entire team from, you know, our own IT staff, uh, obviously to sales, uh, to engineering, to support all focused, hyper-focused on serving the public sector. Um, and then if we look at the kinds of attacks that are occurring here in the in the ramp up that Mr. Zanny showed earlier, you know, I think inarguably it's happening more at edge devices, right? This remote workforce that is that is becoming more prevalent in the world today. And so, you know, there hasn't been a very strong blueprint historically, right? The blueprint for uh, securing the data center, building a perimeter with firewalls and log analytics and vulnerability detection and all those sorts of things that can be managed centrally from a team um, has been kind of well-defined and tweaked and, and, you know, a lot of product development has been around that model of protecting the fortress, right? Um, and so what we're finding is that most of our, most of our customers are, are trying to leverage that outside of the network. But when you're dealing with, you know, anywhere from two to 10 vendors to um, provide your security posture, it becomes challenging uh, especially when you have limitations on the type of connectivity that those vendors can have to your systems, right, a la subscription models and, and you know, potentially hosting data in the cloud, right? And so uh, what we've strived to do is provide, you know, a portfolio of products that are designed to accommodate uh, and not conflict with uh, DOD architecture so that they, we are providing um, the highest level of security uh, at endpoints, particularly around the edge uh, as we move into this um, you know, kind of more scrutinized security posture world uh, driven from, you know, DOD leadership. Um, we're just try basically trying to flip the way that industry has delivered products and services to the DOD because um, you guys are our core focus and you are our, our most important customer, hands down. So if we look at the public sector uh, security landscape then, you know, what we're always hearing about is data breaches, right? Personally identifiable information, um, you know, certainly in uh, the matter of the HHS and stuff, healthcare records, personal data around uh, medical uh, histories, certainly credit card, you know, mortgage financing information. Uh, these are the types of things that hit the headlines pretty much every day. Um, and those things are important, of course, right? And so any vendor that um, you know, claims to offer some level of data protection or cybersecurity is, of course, concerned around building you know, fortresses around each of those data-centered uh, components. 
Um, but for us, what we found is the DOD has used us largely around um, operational assurance uh, and asset protection at the edge for mission critical systems. So instead of saying, look, we want to, you know, protect these SQL databases with your technology, uh, you know, or these virtual machines, it's about I've got Linux operating systems that are running, you know, weapons, navigation, communication systems out in theater, you know, on vessels uh, and aircraft um, that are obviously sensitive in nature, but are not generally uh, important for, you know, data stores, right? But they are generating the sensitive data that then gets stored somewhere, analyzed, uh, and has to be locked down. So that's been largely our focus uh, since we opened our doors a couple years ago. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, how that technology is different from the way industry is pushing products into the DOD market today. Um, but in light of uh, some of the polls that we have going on, we did conduct our own survey um, with a company. And we were interested in hearing from the folks that are on the call today um, what sort of things um, – you know, from an endpoint security perspective and protecting the edge are most concerning to you. And we'll go through the results that we found. I'm curious to see if the breakout between uh, the DOD responses and the civilian responses are the same. So I believe we have a poll uh, that we'll be putting up now. So this is a uh, survey we, we conducted um, before COVID actually became prevalent. Um, with a company called Market Connections and surveyed 200 federal government IT decision makers, uh, influencers, and implementers, uh, 100 of which were from civilian agencies and 100 of which were, were from defense agencies. Um, and the thing that jumps out the most is that it seems like uh, there's a general lack of IT staff knowledge around edge security, um, and that's what's most concerning for their agency, whether they were uh, uh, more of the hands-on technical, you know, fingers of the keyboard resource, uh, whether they were kind of at the director, IT manager level, or senior executive, um, it's pretty clear that, you know, the blueprint, as I mentioned before, for protecting edge networks, as they grow rapidly, right, rather unexpectedly, uh, is certainly um, top of mind as a concern, right? So that means then that more and more um, decision makers protecting DOD networks and civilian agency networks are going to have to rely on industry, right, to provide that guidance, to provide technology that makes it very user-friendly, uh, that makes it, you know, free of false positives, uh, that makes it free from errors, and certainly free from vulnerabilities. But what we're seeing is that, you know, uh, folks are, are rushing as fast as they can in the industry to deliver, you know, more cloud-based services. Uh, which are fine for a lot of civilian agencies as long as you have, you know, the FedRAMP certification and so forth. But it still leaves uh, the DOD edge networks and a lot of their core concerns that they call out, such as securing data in remote locations, uh, combined with, uh, you know, confusing, conflicting, or non-existent standards or policies. Um, we think the industry is going to have to play a bigger role in that true consultative capacity and not just try to push their products uh, into, into programs and networks um, because they have a quota to fill. It's more about working together with the uh, DOD constituents and the integrator partners to help develop products and services that are going to truly match, um, you know, purchasing requirements, security requirements, and really prove themselves first right before just rushing to market. And so that's what we're aiming to do. We have another poll here that's relevant to the next slide we're going to discuss And we'd like to post that now if we have not already. And so as a result of the poll we just posted, it looks like securing data in remote locations is about 50% of the concern. Um, data loss due to stolen devices is not as important. Ransomware uh, had about 25% and human error uh, at about 25%. It seems that uh, the cost uh, concern is not really um, a concern here for this. So the next poll should be up, and that's relative to the next slide we'll be showing. So exactly then, how today uh, are folks looking at protecting um, the data at the edge? What tools are used? What kind of methodologies are being used? Um, and certainly uh, the one that ranks above most are, are the encryption concepts, right? Uh, AES 256-bit is kind of the military-grade standard. There's other lower levels. But by default, a lot of companies have gotten their arms around the fact that data 
uh, needs to be encrypted within the product itself, as well as uh, at rest and in, in, in during transmission, right, to some sort of data store. So that's kind of standard. You know, two-step, uh, two-factor authentication is a big one. Uh, of course, antivirus is kind of standard, right, on any endpoint you get. Um, a lot of folks have been using cloud backup, mostly on the federal and civilian side, uh, not so much certainly on the defense, just to, due to the sensitivity of those networks. And local backup, uh, which is something that we obviously specialize in, um, it is just kind of a line item in every budget, right? It's just kind of one of those um, blocking and tackling components that need to be considered any time you're standing up a network, right, that is going to have pertinent data, pertinent applications running on them um, for true disaster recovery. So these are all kind of traditional methods, right? And if we look to the concept of things like quantum computing, right, it's kind of changing the landscape of how strong and reliable that concept of encryption is, right? And not just with current uh, encryption models, right? But if you look at the ability of a quantum computer to essentially melt very complex encryption methodologies in a matter of moments, which used to take, you know, weeks, months, or years to do, uh, that threat horizon is moving towards us much faster than I think most people realize, right? And so our understanding is that, uh, you know, RSA is kind of the standard for the encryption methodologies that they've gone above and there are going to be new standards released um, to prevent, you know, uh, assets that are currently encrypted with the highest standards um, from being captured and stored that they can later be broken, right? Because in the DOD, um, it's not just about what data is trans is moving now, right? What kind of communications are moving across the wire today? It's also there was sensitive information from five years ago, ten years ago, you know, that were encrypted with the lower level of encryption capabilities at the time, right? Which seemed to be highest military grade. Um, and so any bad actor, um, you know, that has uh, those communications that are encrypted with those lower methodologies and has the quantum computing. Um, power behind it are, are certainly already in the process of, of melting those keys um, today and accessing, you know, what was classified data you know, five years ago, maybe just as recently as two years ago or even 10 years ago. Um, the fact that that data is classified means it probably still is classified, right? And so we know that uh, nation states are, are getting access to those data points, right, and discerning um, kind of where the federal government and the DOD has planned to move, you know, long-term plans and things of that nature. Um, so encryption alone, obviously, is not going to get it done. We have to keep evolving uh, with encryption methodologies in relation to the capabilities of those programs of quantum computing that um, inevitably are moving much faster than, than many folks realize. So we see encryption, the results from the poll um, is up there at 28%, two-step authentication, 24%, uh, antivirus, 21%, cloud backup even lower at 17%. And, um, you know, anti-ransomware anti is only pulling in at 3%. So I think over time, these numbers have changed. Certainly if the um, COVID-19 um, pandemic, you know, continues to force stay-at-home orders, uh, or if we, you know, God forbid, have a second wave or even third wave of uh, the spreading, I think the reality is, is that remote workforces that are operating out of their home environments, right, relying on um, uh, co community entities, public entities, and private entities to provide their internet services um, to access sensitive data stores, you know, back at their central repositories or wherever they might reside, um, is going to continue to be a prime target. Uh, and let's be real, for the Comcast and the Cox and the Verizons of the world, um, make no claims to protect your home networks with the routers they provide you, right? Um, so it, it really relies on the end user and the organization to really focus on the endpoint. Um, when it comes to just personal use devices. Obviously, in the edge networks um, for mission critical assets, uh, there has been no overarching um, you know, broadband provider or internet provider that, that claims to protect uh, weapon systems, navigation systems, right? That all falls to the integrators and the DOD constituents who are relying on these tools, uh, whether it's in theater or in simulations. And then finally, I think we have a last poll here um, around how many different security tools and vendors are currently leveraged for your edge data protection process today. And so if we can post that poll, um, be interested to see what a lot of the take is. Um, we see that more often than not, it's, it, it's anywhere between five and 10. And it, it's obviously a subjective question, right? Because 
if you look at log analysis, SIM tools, you know, as a security posture versus true data protection, those are kind of more reactionary, but certainly get lumped together in, in the cybersecurity toolkit that many folks look at. So while those polling results are coming in, um, you know, one of the challenges uh, for vendors such as ourselves is delivering products that are, are safe, uh, accessible, you know, provide privacy and certainly authentic, authenticity, right, of the user, of the data itself, uh, and, of course, paramount of security. So um, a lot of times when you're rushing and as a, you know, a public entity to bring new products to market before your next quarterly results, right, get reported, um, something along the line of these concepts typically uh, gets denigrated and sacrificed, right? So we've made it our core focus to deliver, you know, the reliability um, for all the data protection methodologies you're using, asset protection, um, that they are accessible in a secure fashion. They're providing privacy and authenticity up the chain so that you know if you take a backup, for instance, you know, of a Linux or a Windows device that has sensitive data on it, that from the point in time that that backup was created, um, it was authenticated by a user that had permission to access it, right, and that any transfer of that data, of course, is encrypted with the highest grade standards, and that, you know, anytime you leave that data store, that backup file or whatever that might be in a repository, that it stays encrypted, right, and stays protected, and that there are anti-ransomware type um, methodologies being used on that file itself to prevent what is the most common uh, ransomware attack, right, of, of actually going in and deleting backups or, or encrypting backups that are already encrypted so that, uh, you know, before an attack actually starts encrypting the files, uh, on the actual endpoint, it's already removed access to those um, backups that are in the repository. So we'll talk a little bit more about how that's done using, uh, you know, AI and machine learning and so forth. And so the highest uh, number of vendors in the segment that came in was between two and five. And then those that had 10 and above were the second highest. Uh, so 80% use anywhere from two to five vendors. Uh, and then 20% use 10 or more, obviously depending upon the size of the program you're involved in, depending upon the size of the environment you're in, um, those sorts of things vary. Um, but the idea here is that uh, at a minimum, you're using multitude of vendors, right, to provide a variety of different security components um, to enhance your cybersecurity posture. Um, and we think that with the increased mandate from Katie Arrington and her team around the CMMMC, right, Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certifications, um, that consolidation of those vendors is going to be a key point, and it'll help to unify uh, the security practices of both the technology itself as well as the policies implemented, um, either through the products themselves, right, mapping um, things like FISMA guidelines, NIST guidelines, uh, to product capabilities and spelling out exactly how those um, functions within the product map directly to uh, those core policies is certainly a focus for us, as it is for many vendors. Um, and then, you know, what kind of guidance can be provided along, not just training, right, but as you look at the DOD network, um, you know, really putting together a solution that might not necessarily include all the features and functionality that you have. And so looking out past your own organization to say, look, we've done business together, you know, for this DOD program with this particular vendor, uh, why don't we bring them in um, because, you know, that particular program was able to maintain its authority to operate um, by using, a, you know, a confluence of these of these vendors, right? And I think more and more what we're going to see is more vendors such as ourselves included are going to be offering platform type services, right, um, through a single agent that will help consolidate a number of vendors that are being used. And obviously there's a lot of advantages there because, you know, it'll help increase visibility and influence of the roadmap uh, when you buy at scale from a particular vendor. Um, it'll certainly help with overhead related to license and vendor management and so on. Um, so I think we're going to see that continue in the industry as well. Um, so that in some point in time, you're not going to have to have, you know, five to ten vendors for your uh, antivirus and your vulnerability detection and your patch management. Um, you know, goals of companies like ours are to, you know, bring that into a single offering as much as possible. So there's just really one throat to choke uh, from a, a DOD constituent perspective, which just makes everything a lot easier um, from an acquisition and maintenance perspective as well. So uh, the unified approach, a lot of talk about cyber hygiene, 
uh, has been used in the DOD uh, networking circles. Obviously pushed down a lot from Katie Arrington, you know, unification of standards, right, across DOD networks as well as um, the federal systems integrators and the network that they bring to the table, right, their own internal networks, right, because if they're, you know, copying a lot of data or they're replicating proprietary applications in their own labs and things like that before bringing them into production into a DOD network, it makes sense that those environments are protected with the highest standards as well. And then that then flows down to, of course, you know, the subcontractors that are, are brought on to help build specific applications or integrate components to a platform before delivering, uh, you know, to the Navy, Army, and so forth. And so if we think about the cyber hygiene concept, you know, we liken a lot of the cybersecurity posture to that of physical health, right, biological health. Um, so the prevention mechanisms involved, you know, and this kind of maps to a number of the different vendors, right, that many of you folks are, are using. You've got one vendor that focuses on uh, prevention, you know, which likens itself to vaccinating yourself against um, diseases that are communicable. Uh, the detection aspect, response, recovery, forensics, you know, there's different vendors that specialize in all these things, right? But wouldn't it be nice to have, um, you know, a solution suite available where all of this stuff is kind of streamlined, much of it automated, right? And so that you don't need to focus on having an interaction and getting sold something that claims it can do, you know, one or more of these concepts, um, that there's an actual solution in the marketplace that's designed and um, with the DOD, you know, operational requirements, security requirements in mind. Um, and so, you know, if we think about the, the biological connection here, you know, it's very clear that cyber hygiene and, and your cyber posture does quite um, easily draw a parallel uh, to the way that we think about physical health. So this brings us to, um, you know, what it is we have in the market today, and then we'll talk a little bit about what's coming out um, uh, as relative, relative to all the things I've just discussed. Um, but we have today on the DOD IN APL, uh, it's called our Cyber Backup 12.5 Hard Edition. And this product was indeed purpose built for our DOD customers. Um, meaning we have kind of retrofit this technology to go against the common grain of the way industry is moving to a more connected first, uh, API first type of model, right? Because anytime you're introducing connectivity to sensitive environments, whether it's via API or some sort of subscription service, um, you are in fact increasing the attack surface uh, of that environment, right? And now exposing uh, an outlet there um, to third party tools that you might not even be aware of right, that are integrated or being invited to connect uh, to a platform you've chosen and gotten authority to operate on. Um, so for us, you know, we're focusing on supporting that, you know, underserved population of the DOD that has very common um, tasks around cloning, SIG devices, imaging them, um, restoring them to bare metal, you know, using bootable ISOs and things of that nature, so that the, all the work they spent in, in getting a platform or an application certified um, they have an ability to clone that and move that seamlessly around their network in a very secure fashion um, from a single interface, right, whether it's physical to virtual, virtual to virtual, or, or even virtual back to physical. Um, and so this plays into not just your typical data protection or disaster recovery processes, but it's also being used quite a bit in um, DevSecOps uh, environments, right, because you're spending a lot of time as an integrator, um, you know, building these secure proprietary applications that are going to be placed on ships, um, before you introduce a new application uh, or a new service into a platform, you want to make sure you're constantly backing that up and have a standard working state to revert to in the event that the uh, injection of a new application does not take, right, or crashes the system. And then they're actually using the product to migrate uh, images from the lab um, that were developed on STIG devices to the actual production environments, um, such as the littoral combat ships, for instance. So we re-architected this product. Um, it had been in the market for a while, um, but we basically ripped out a lot of the guts and rebuilt it to the DOD specs, right? Um, so we're using the highest grade encryption available today. We will update the encryption methodologies on these things, and I'll talk a little bit more about going through the APL process here in the following slide and the different um, stackable components we had to meet in order to get there. Um, but our goal here is from an organization and a technology delivery perspective was to keep everything we do um, keep every all of our focus on how the DOD needs this product and this organization to operate, right, to make it a very seamless uh, and easy 
uh, acquisition process, um, authority to operate process, and so forth. And so when you look at the way that I mentioned before, a lot of products are brought to market, it's with the commercial sector in mind, and then they try to make some modifications, right, to suit uh, DOD requirements. And Katie Arrington and her team have been very clear and very transparent that moving forward, um, you know, graying out uh, an option to, you know, enable a cloud-related service or graying out an option to move, you know, replicate your data to a cloud store somewhere um, is not going to be sufficient. They want evidence that the product has been re-architected and purpose-built for the DOD. I actually just got an email yesterday from uh, one of our NASA customers who's asking to, to trial this software, and he expressed a core concern about, you know, connectivity. And he said, I want to make sure that, you know, we just want a trial that's going to, you know, uh, expire after a certain amount of time so that the end users are not inadvertently using it beyond the requirements. We want to take a look at your end user licensing agreement. Uh, and then the telling part was he said, because we had a situation not too long ago where we were evaluating software in our environment, uh, the subscription period, had, or excuse me, the uh, trial period had ended, but the subscription was still live. And the vendor sent us a bill, an invoice, for trial software uh, 30 days later, and they were able to prove that the product was still in use because they had access to that environment um, through their data center because it was a subscription service. And so uh, NASA ended up having to pay a bill for a product they ultimately decided they didn't even want in their environment. Um, so that sort of connectivity is kind of what we're talking about here, right? That's what industry is moving towards. And whether it's intentional to be used as an unscrupulous you know, process to extract you know, money from their, their customers, I, I don't quite know. Um, obviously, it's created in the commercial space to increase productivity and ease of use. Um, but again, when you're putting it in a DOD network, uh, there should be no pinging in and pinging out, right, uh, or any sensitive or sensitive but unclassified network. Um, it causes a lot of problems around exposure um, as a channel into that environment. So we've kind of gone the other direction, right, and said we're going to rip out any connectivity and allow, um, you know, accessing of this product to be local. Uh, bricked and that there is no attempt in any capacity for us to call into that software or for that software to attempt to call out, which obviously makes um, the teams, uh, the firewall teams, right, uh, pretty happy. They don't have to run and jump at false alarms or try to figure out, you know, what sort of uh, application is trying to call out of their environment or call into the environment. So a brief part about where we sit today, as, as John Zanny mentioned, you know, the, the company's been around, um, you know, over 16 years. Uh, we have thousands of DOD federal civilian system integrator customers uh, across many different types of footprints. You know, we're in pretty much every major program uh, in some capacity, certainly within the Navy, uh, Air Force, and the Army. Um, but we, our core focus is, again, focusing on the mission-critical assets, right, protecting uh, the navigation systems, comms, weapons, radar, sonar that are existing on these ships. And we do the data protection element too. Um, it's just we've really tried to focus on a niche of supporting this type of an edge environment uh, with our technology and have cared less about moving up into the enterprise to be that kind of overarching, you know, solution that's going to sit on every workstation at the IRS, for instance. Um, so we're hyper-focused on this market. Um, that bleeds into a lot of the training and, and testing. We sit on a lot of the simulator systems in the Navy and the Air Force, um, protecting the stack itself that are running these 24 by 7 simulation programs, as well as the data they generate when they, when they meet their final repository. Weapons testing facilities, um, artillery ranges, you know, generating uh, simulations for uh, combat and analyzing all that data about the you know, trajectory elements of the artillery and, and mobile command movement. Um, you know, these things that you're doing in simulation, right, are meant to emulate uh, what will happen in combat. So suffering any sort of downtime um, from an application that's, you know, literally driving a tank or an unmanned aircraft, right, just completely messes with uh, the analytics capabilities of what you would expect to happen in real time. Um, so these are the types of environments that we're hyper-focused on. Um, and, you know, our goal is to be the standard uh, imaging, cloning, uh, disk utility, backup and recovery, disaster recovery tool you know, for mission critical assets across the DOD. And that's why we've changed everything about our organization, the way we go to market from the products to the organization itself and how we support the DOD. So if we look at getting on the APL, which is something we're very proud of, we're the only full disk image backup and disaster recovery solution on the APL. 
and going back to uh, the unification message from Katie Arrington, we know that each DOD branch um, has their own version of the APL. And what we've been told and kind of uh, has been intimated to us is that they're looking for a higher, a more umbrella standard, right? Something they can point to that is extremely strict, um, is constantly updated, um, you know, has gone through all of these elements, which we call stackable uh, certifications. And we chose to pursue the DOD and APL because um, we view it as the gold standard of security and interoperability uh, for these reasons, right? First, FIPS. Uh, 140-2, right, is the is the, the highest level of, of encryption methodologies that you can include in your product. Uh, this is very common. You know, it's, it's a prerequisite to be on many of the, the branch-specific APLs. Um, but this basically takes a look at, um, you know, how the data within the product itself um, is, is communicating with itself, right? So this looks at the data transition, the encryption methodologies for agent and server combinations, which is, is highlighted in our product. Um, you know, how data at rest is treated, how data in transit is treated, um, and, you know, making sure those things are all wrapped with an encryption methodology that meets the highest standards of the DOD. Common criteria goes a little a one step beyond that and looks at how the application communicates with other um, devices on the network, right, using TLS and the highest standards of security there um, to make sure that there's no bleeding or uh, leaking of any data transmission uh, that everything is wrapped and kind of contained and transparent uh, in terms of how, you know, your process processes communicate outside of itself, right, which is a challenge for a lot of, um, you know, data management type platforms that leverage APIs from other, you know, aspects, other applications within the environment that may not have FIPS themselves or is open source, for instance. Um, so looking at common criteria as the next iteration of the security process um, is something that's somewhat unique to the APL. I know it's a prerequisite on some other branch-specific APLs, depending upon where in the network that product is going to sit. Um, but we felt that having these two together um, certainly strengthened our case as the most secure backup and recovery, disaster recovery point solution uh, in the market today. And of course, being on the DODN APL um, just alleviates a lot of procurement-related headaches, right? And having to write exceptions or ATO, for ATOs to use products from a commercially provided vendor uh, in a DOD network. So you don't have to spend a lot of development cycles or scripting cycles, right? Uh, kind of being forced to use a limited amount of tools uh, that have gone through this process. And so for common criteria, we actually had to create our own protection profiles um, for an agent server combination because it did not exist in the common criteria architecture yet. Um, so that's why we are confident what we're doing, you know, is designed with the DOD in mind and we are, you know, actually blazing a path um, potentially for other vendors like ourselves uh, to now attach themselves to the, the efforts that we've done. Um, but the idea here is that we're standardizing and helping to unify, uh, to Katie Arrington's point, um, the security posture uh, for products, not just in the DOD networks, but of course the federal systems integrators uh, that are supporting those networks. So, about the consolidation that I referenced before, right, of, of kind of bringing together, um, you know, a number of different security capabilities, you know, under a single roof. Uh, and obviously consolidation is um, a benefit to all involved, right? Because, you know, it used to be that you have, you know, one vendor for your phone uh, at home, you'd have another cable provider, right, and you'd have a separate internet provider. And over time we've seen that, um, you know, those folks have been able to enhance their technology and their communication protocols such that you're just kind of going with one uh, vendor, right, for all of your uh, entertainment needs, all of your communication needs within your own home. And so that's kind of a driving focus that we're looking at um, and providing some relatively new coverage for concerns around collaboration applications, right? I'm pretty sure everybody's heard about, you know, Zoom getting dinged um, about, you know, some open security holes that they have in their collaboration platforms, which they're addressing. Um, but we're going as far to protect basically the work from home environment that we think is going to be um, persistent for quite some time. Um, and of course, those, those general protection methodologies around endpoints such as antivirus, anti-malware, uh, patch management, vulnerability detection, um, bringing all that in together on a single agent and removing four or five other agents, you know, obviously frees up some, some operations capacity, you know, for these endpoints that are, you know, being tasked now to, to run outside of a DOD network where there is very little protection 
provided by the ISV, the internet service provider, they're leveraging in their in their home environment. I think we're coming up on time here, and we did want to leave a little bit um, for Q and A. And so, you know, in summation, the whole message here is that you know, as as users uh, and um, you know. Uh, being part of a DOD network, right? It behooves um, you guys as managers, as folks with their fingers on the keyboard um, to make your lives easier, right? And to look towards organizations that have a very strong focus, right? On this marketplace. Um, and because you have a lot of leverage with companies like ourselves um, to help influence roadmaps, right? We want to understand, you know, what uh, obstacles you're, you're running into. It shouldn't take you guys you know, months and months to write exceptions and get authority to operate on a on a COP solution when the vendor's just going to turn around and release another update, right, a major update that then also has to be validated, right? So being part of the APL ensures that we are ongoing, um, you know, if, if we do release upgrades and, and updates and things of that nature, that those things are being certified as well. You don't have to put the onus on yourself um, to go through and identify what has changed within the product, right, as a result of the upgrade. Um, so we're taking that workload off of your plate. Uh, we know that backup and recovery um, is used in you know pretty much every program in the DoD. Um, so again, our, our focus is to be that standard that that you folks look to whenever you have an imaging or cloning or disaster recovery or backup uh, requirement, right? And our competition is simply not doing this because they're still stuck in that world of um, being a subcomponent of a larger company that is primarily focused on the commercial landscape, and they're trying to compete with product managers and developers, right, to introduce the, the features and functionality and security protocols that, that you folks require in order just to simply use the product in its intended capacity in your environment. So I think that's all I had. Um, Mr. Zani, it looks like there's some questions coming through, some of which are directed to you, and we'll just kind of parry uh, back and forth and address them uh, as they come in. Yeah. Uh, yeah, John, so uh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, it is now time for the Q&A, as you mentioned. And just as a reminder uh, to our, our listeners and viewers, to submit questions, please use the Ask a Question box on the webinar console. And as mentioned, we do have uh, some questions coming in already. For John Zanny, um, is there enough urgency within the DOD and contractor community surrounding cyber protection of edge and endpoint environments right now? So uh, my answer to that is no, but then I uh, spend my days driving a sense of urgency. Uh, uh, the importance is, is that we were caught off guard uh, with this pandemic, and now uh, people, agencies, uh, groups are scrambling uh, to make sure that they're protected at the edge and the endpoint. So that this is an example of where uh, because uh, there was a bit of a lack of urgency there. Uh, we're cut off guard, and now um, uh, different organizations have to find the budget to protect uh, these systems. I hope that this will uh, be a lesson for all of us so that we can be better, better prepared for the future uh, because we're not going to get more centralized. We're going to get more decentralized. And it will not just be communication. It will be compute, data, and data is uh, part of our lifeblood. Okay, great. I think the uh, next question is for you as well. Uh, why is backup and DR such a central component of a good cyber hygiene strategy? Well, cyber, cyber hygiene, uh, as John Downey pointed out in a slide, has to do uh, with a set of measures uh, uh, ranging from preventative all the way to recovery and forensics, very much the way you would treat a virus uh, or an illness. Uh, or as my father you, uh, would say, <clears throat> no matter how healthy you are, uh, one day you're going to end up in the hospital, and so you better have good insurance. And so backup and DR is a central component because uh, when you do go down, and hopefully it won't happen often, but it does happen, it could be a bad actor. It could be a bad piece of hardware. Uh, you want to be able to have that operational assurance and get up and running as quickly as possible. And to do that, you need a good uh, backup and DR solution. 
Otherwise, uh, you will lose productivity. And in some cases, uh, in the federal government, uh, it could be a matter of life or death. Okay, uh, good answer. I think the next question is probably for either one of you. Uh, for a unified approach, the challenge of getting the best of breed in each category does not translate to the best of breed in an integrated approach and high cost. How do you address that? Sure, so I'll, I'll grab this one, and it's a, it's a valid question, right? Um, but what we see is, especially around developing security products, right, and certainly the task of updating them. If you look at vulnerability and patch management, for instance, antivirus, you know, teams of researchers at each one of these independent uh, technology firms that, that bring that product to market um, are leveraging open source uh, communications, right, around those vulnerabilities and how they're discovered. So it's really a matter of just tapping into uh, and making sure you have coverage uh, for the source of updating you know, vulnerability data um, and making your constituents aware of it in a timely fashion. Um, and so that's just a matter of, of uh, resources, right? And if you're gonna have that as part of your dedicated platform, you obviously have to have teams of people dedicated, right? That run their own SOC and their own NOC um, that are constantly monitoring you know, open source channels for uh, vulnerabilities, paying attention to um, you know, the major vendors of the space at the operating system level, at the hardware level. Um, so it's not that hard to replicate the ability, um, you know, for one company to consolidate uh, the source of that information and deliver updates to products, right, and deliver features and functionality to products in response to uh, what is commonly an open source forum, right, for the identification of these uh, existing vulnerabilities, right? So everybody's kind of accessing the same source and using the same channels, um, to, to rapidly update their technology. There's nothing really proprietary uh, that much anymore about that because it's such a strong open source community. Um, and as far as the cost goes, I would actually argue that it reduces the, the footprint of the financial burden, right? Much like it reduces the footprint of the overhead related to just processing of orders, right? Processing renewals, license administration, license management. It's all consolidated and contained with a single vendor with whom now you have um, a lot more leverage with uh, because you're leveraging them for a number of different practices, whereas before you could be, um, you know, a big customer to one security provider based on your environment and network and requirements, and you could be a very small customer, uh, similarly in the same environment, to a different provider. And so, you know, being that kind of VIP that, you know, you have the buy-in from your security teams, your CTOs, your CISOs, um, because where you're protecting so much with a single vendor, um, that provides a lot of weight in terms of, you know, helping direct that vendor in terms of the development they need uh, around supporting, you know, your mission uh, as well as your environment. Okay, good. Thank you, John. And one of our viewers is interested in the uh, slide deck that you guys presented today. Do we know if that's going to be available to participants? Uh, yes, we'll make it available. Okay, super. And um, this might be the last question. We have uh, less than two minutes left. How does 5G improve the edge data security concerns? Uh, I'll, I'll take this, John. It, it, it's, it's actually not that, that relevant. Uh, first, it's going to be a long time before uh, all of us are exclusively on 5G. Uh, our concern is to provide uh, data uh, security and cyber protection no matter what networks you use. And so uh, while I'm sure there'll be some improvements over 5G, uh, it'll help with speed uh, for sure so that you can protect more data more often and lower recovery times. Uh, but uh, it's a separate uh, component to making sure your data is secure in any environment. Okay. Uh, we can uh, crank through the next three very quickly. John, uh, do you want to? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is a trial version of the hardened edition available? Uh, yes, it is. You just need to reach out to John Downey uh, or anybody at Acronis SES and we'll make it available. Okay. Next one is, if I have an issue with my hardened edition software, who should I contact? Uh, we have a support form on our website, or you can reach out to one of us. We're a very responsive team, and you will reach a U.S. citizen, uh, most likely based in Scottsdale, Arizona. 
Okay, and last question, what type of licenses are available for the hardened edition? John Downey? Yeah, so we protect a variety of workloads. Um, and if we look at um, the licensing structure that we've delivered, um, we have things you know, that protect all workloads around virtual uh, environments, physical environments for Linux, Windows, what have you. Um, but the unique thing about us is because we you know, are structured in such a way to be flexible, around the purchasing and procurement requirements of the DOD, you know, we do offer a lot of times things that are very convenient, such as blanket purchasing agreements, enterprise license agreements, contract specific licenses, you know, delivering golden keys um, so that, uh, you know, uh, an FSI can just use our technology uh, on a whim as needed for as many devices as it requires without having to true up and buy things ad hoc, you know, which obviously reduce costs and overhead. Uh, we also do program specific licenses, you know, for one to 10 years um, relative to the, the contract in question that, uh, you know, our technology will be supporting with that integrator. Okay, excellent. Thank you, uh, John Zanny and John Downey, and thank you to our viewers for submitting questions. Please note that there are several resources available to you under the resources tab. And I would also like to point out that you can continue to link to the archived version of this webinar and you can see previous Signal webinars on FCA's Signal Magazine webinar. That concludes our Signal Magazine webinar for today. Again, we thank you all for being with us. Have a great day, everybody.